what they say. See my face in lights, all my name, my monkeys found down on Broadway. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this civic conversation on police reform and public safety. I'm Ben Max, the editor of Gotham Gazette, a publication of Citizens Union Foundation. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, of course, to Citizens Union and Citizens Union Foundation for bringing us together and this great event that we're having in the next conversation of this series. I want to say that uh, off the bat, Disability Rights New York is providing closed captioning and American Sign Language interpretation for this event. You can access closed captions through Zoom's subtitles by selecting the three dots at the bottom right of your Zoom window and select show subtitles. You can also access the captioning on stream text and we'll put that link into the chat for you now. Donna Jean, an advocate at Disability Rights New York, is providing ASL today. She will be spotlighted for today's program. There's Donna Jean. If you do not see her on your screen, but would like to, you can also pin Donna Jean to your Zoom view. Disability Rights New York helps to make sure that everyone, including people with disabilities, are a part of the conversation. Disability Rights New York helps people with disabilities who face barriers because of their disability, including voting. We thank Disability Rights New York for providing this valuable service at this conversation and others that we've had and will have. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce Betsy Gottbaum, the Executive Director of Citizens Union and Citizens Union Foundation for some brief opening remarks. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, what I would like to say is one that the uh, Citizens Union Foundation, the Subcommittee on Police Reform has just issued a report, uh, which is very timely. And this report deals with accountability and, and um, governance and the things that are of so, so much important, uh, so, so important now. And uh, this morning's panel is part of our civic education um, event, part of our civic education events. And, I just want to say that we can only do this with your support and we would appreciate any support that you could give to Citizens Union. Um, civic conversation, which is what we're having this morning, they're so important for New Yorkers to know what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. So we're here for a conversation on police reform and public safety. Obviously all of the work that uh, Citizens Union and Citizens Union Foundation is doing, including supporting us at Gotham Gazette is important. So please do support uh, Citizens Union, Citizens Union Foundation at this time, doing a lot of reform work and also uh, helping make sure that we can publish at GothamGazette.com. Please do visit us and our latest reporting on New York politics and policy and sign up for our newsletter that comes every morning at about 7 a.m. Uh, very much looking forward to today's conversation. I'm going to introduce our three great panelists. We're going to have a fairly brief, but I'm sure very interesting conversation here on the topics at hand, which of course uh, are always timely and especially so now. So joining us today, we have City Council Member Adrian Adams of Queens, District 28 in the City Council, and she chairs the City Council's Committee on Public Safety. She's the first woman to represent the Queens neighborhoods of Jamaica, Rockdale Village, Richmond Hill, and South Ozone Park. And she is a professional executive corporate trainer and professional vocalist. And we won't ask her to show those last two talents this morning, maybe, probably, but thank you so much for being here, council member. And we have with us Reverend Fred Davey, who chairs the Civilian Complaint Review Board, the CCRB which provides civilian oversight of the New York City Police Department. He also serves as Executive Vice President of Union Theological Seminary. Chair Davey, thanks so much for being here. 
And John Miller is, of course, the NYPD's Deputy Commissioner of Intelligence and Counterterrorism, where he oversees the Intelligence Bureau, the Counterterrorism Bureau, and the NYPD's partnership in the FBI-NYPD Joint Terrorism Task Force. And he is also an Emmy Award-winning journalist. Deputy Commissioner Miller, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. All right, so uh, we are all, of course, excited to hear from our great panelists. Uh, a couple of brief introductory notes from me as we get going here. Um, obviously, over the last several years, increasingly intensely uh, in the last year, we've seen demands for police reform, for accountability, transparency, more just and, and racially balanced policing. Uh, for ending police brutality and other changes, including to some of the fundamental responsibilities of the police, such as things like responses to mental health crisis calls. Many of these calls for reform have, of course, been the topic of debate and a lot of conversation, including some pushback from elected officials, police officials, and others. Many reforms have been announced and passed in New York City and state. Many, many reforms. Uh, and But questions and calls for reform do persist, of course, including around accountability, transparency, and racial justice. We've seen just recently even more reforms announced by the mayor and the police department just after a package of reforms was passed through the city council with the mayor's support. Complicating matters, of course, is that we've seen a pandemic era increase in gun violence across the city and in many cities across the state and the country. And we've also seen some surges in hate crimes against certain demographic groups like Orthodox Jews and more recently Asian Americans. We have also seen the debate over police funding uh, really heat up last year and it will probably again this year leading up to the budget. So many reforms have been passed in New York recently, including outlawing chokeholds by police officers, a new disciplinary matrix, uh, efforts to strengthen the CCRB that Chair Davey uh, chairs, and changes to officer recruitment and much, much more. We won't be able to get into every single one today, but we will get into several and also some of the conversation around where things stand and where they're headed. Uh, the city council and the de Blasio administration just passed a package, but as you heard, Citizens Union has also put forth a report with recommendations, especially focused on structural trans transparency, accountability, and many, many pieces to it. You should all check out that link, which has been posted in the chat and at the Citizens Union website. Uh, a couple of highlights include changes to how the mayor structures police department management by creating a deputy mayor for public safety and making the police commissioner subject to the advice and consent of the city council and much, much more. All right, a couple of additional data points and then we'll get to our panelists. According to the mayor's office, comparing 2020, to 2013, the year before Mayor de Blasio took office, there were approximately 182,000 fewer stop and frisk incidents, a 95% reduction, 253,000 fewer arrests, a 64% reduction, and 5,900 fewer people in jail on an average day, a 52% reduction. And throughout that time, until last year with the surge in gun violence, just about every metric of crime was trending downward over those seven years. And really it's been a roughly three decade decline overall. But of course, as I said, we did see a surge last year in shootings and murders, and that is part of the discussion here as well. All right, so let's get to our great panelists. Council Member Adams, you chair the Public Safety Committee in the City Council. You've been uh, on top of a lot of what's been happening in terms of reform passing through the council. For you, what are a couple, two, three highlights of what's been passed recently and why are they important? Thank you, Ben. And I uh, just want to say good morning again. Thank you to Betsy, Melanie, and to yourself, uh, all of our great friends at Citizens Union for organizing this morning's breakfast brief on police reform and public safety. And also good morning to my fellow panelists here for Davey and Deputy Commissioner John Miller. It's great to see you as well. Uh, ben, I'm very pleased with the City Council's most recent package of police reform uh, legislation because I believe that it is groundbreaking. I believe that it's going to make a difference in making policing in New York City more fair, transparent, and accountable. There were several bills in that package um, that I'd like to highlight. The first would be my own bill, 
uh, 1671A. This bill completely changes how the NYPD reports on vehicle stops. We, we know that stop and frisk was not the end of stop and frisk. So my legislation requires the NYPD to report on the number of summonses issued, arrests made, and vehicles seized. This information is going to then be broken down by precinct, race, ethnicity, and age. And this is really important because police officers will be required to document all encounters, even those that don't lead to a traffic ticket or lead to an arrest. It's something that's not done. It's never been done before. Now as a city, we'll have a much clearer picture with data on who's being stopped and what actually happened as a result of these stops. The other bill, the controversial bill that everyone was talking about that I'd like to highlight is my colleague Steve Levin's bill to win qualified immunity for police officers. Now, essentially this law makes it easier for people to bring legal action if a police officer violates their right of security against unreasonable search and seizure or excessive force. No other jurisdiction in the country has passed a law like this. And I think it's an important tool for New Yorkers to have when they've been wronged by the actions of a police officer. This legislation also takes the financial burden of bad police behavior off of the taxpayer and it places it directly onto the offending officer. The package also includes two resolutions that call on the state legislature to pass two bills that will improve accountability. The first resolution supports a state bill to remove the police commissioner's final and exclusive authority over discipline. And I'm sure Chair Davey will expound on this as well. This is an issue that I strongly believe in. The CCRB must be given the final say over disciplinary matters. If we ever want to restore the public's faith in fair policing, we need to have an independence when it comes to doling out discipline for officers who commit wrongdoings. So while the co police commissioner at the times escalated the penalties, we know that in far too many cases, um, it's resulted in uh, CCRB recommendations that were ignored or overridden or downgraded, and that has to change. The second resolution supports state legislation that would require NYPD officers to live in New York City. I believe police officers who come from our neighborhoods understand our backgrounds and have a personal stake in our communities those are police officers that will better serve our residents. So it's as simple as that. Um, as for what my overarching goal is when it comes to police reform, I think that we need to fundamentally change policing so that it's accountable to the people whom police officers are sworn to protect and serve. This is indeed a long-term effort. It's going to involve not just one elected official, but everyone, including the mayor, the NYPD, the city council, advocates and families who have been affected by unjust policing. I've heard from a lot of them in my hearings over the past few months. So there really is no single action or step that will lead to that change, but rather a commitment to continuous change until we live in a city, let's be honest, until we live in a city where black and brown New Yorkers no longer fear being pulled over or uh, interacting with law enforcement. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll this yesterday, I attended a press conference hosted by my predecessor as chair of the Public Safety uh, Committee, Queensborough President Donovan Richards. Um, this was shortly after the guilty verdict for Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd. And as I said then, that true justice would mean that George Floyd is still alive to hug his friends and family. This would mean living in a society where communities of color are given the proper resources and investments so we don't have two worlds, one that's unsafe, over-policed, and under-resourced, and another that has an abundance of resources, is safe where police presence is not so overwhelming. So that's my vision, Ben. So Thank again, you. it's not that simple, and it won't be fast, but we've got to believe in, and we've got to fight for this goal in the long term if we transform our city into a safe, fair, and equitable place for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Miller, uh, you there might be a couple of things there that you want to um, give the, the department's stance on at this point, uh, but also broadly speaking, how do you capture right now where the department is in its evolution? Uh, the department has been uh, supportive of and going along with a number of reforms, but there's also been spots where the department and the police commissioner and others have tried to draw a line, have pushed back. 
how do you capture broadly speaking where the NYPD is in that evolution that Councilmember Adams just talked about? Well, Ben, I think if you if you look at it from a broad perspective, uh, what we're seeing is um, we're seeing a moment in policing across the country. Um, and you've seen here in New York State, the governor put out his police reform mandate. Everybody had to report uh, every department in the state what they were doing. Uh, one of the benefits at the NYPD is uh, we didn't wake up the morning after George Floyd in Minnesota or the morning after Eric Garner in New York City and say, we need to contemplate reform. Uh, since 2014, the NYPD has been going through a series of reforms, some self-driven, some driven by our colleagues in the council, um, some driven by advocates. But when you look at that as a continuum, you know, you've seen uh, uh, the body camera um, project, which for a department this large, uh, to do it in the time we did it and get it right technically was a big feat. Uh, after the Garner case, you saw that we had a chokehold ban that was in place for years, but we realized we had to train officers further on if you were not going to be able to use a chokehold to take somebody down, what were other takedown techniques uh, that would be able to replace that? And we were able to retrain under Commissioner Bratton, 36,000 police officers in those tactics. Uh, we have done more community outreach. We have increased um, our uh, neighborhood policing program to a neighborhood policing philosophy that goes throughout the department. I mean, everybody in the precinct um, who's interested in what's going on in that precinct knows their neighborhood coordination officers. So we have a long list of things from our bias training, uh, which was cultural awareness in the police academy to something much more sophisticated, the implicit bias training, which really asked police officers to reach into their subconscious and recognize biases that live below the surface that come from learned behavior experience um, and be able to push those up and say, how do I do my job in a fair, impartial um, way and recognize these and, and work around them? So I think when you look at the overarching picture in terms of reform, um, we have been going down this road longer than most agencies and further than most agencies. Now that is that, that road doesn't have an end. It's a continuum. Uh, conditions will change, times will change, uh, a society gets the policing it demands um, and will adjust to that. As the council member pointed out, uh, those things are moving forward in, in many different directions. But I think we're in a good place. And given the events we've seen this week, the fact that we had citywide demonstrations across multiple boroughs involving uh, a couple of thousand people uh, or more, that there was not a single summons issued, not a single arrest made, and not because we had a hands-off approach, but because between the outreach, a year invested um, uh, in community affairs and bridge building, none of that was required. That was the model. And we didn't get there by accident. Okay, thank you. I wanna uh, come back to a couple of things you said in a minute, but let's talk to uh, CCRB Chair Fred Davey. Uh, Chair Davey, where does the CCRB stand in its, it, there's been a, a, an expansion of its powers in recent years, but there's also uh, more powers that are being given to you. There's more powers that you're seeking, as uh, Councilmember Adams said, there's this question of whether the CCRB will get the ultimate disciplinary authority, uh, which now resides with the police commissioner. So how do you capture um, where the CCRB is in its, in its evolution of its powers and where it's heading? Sure. <laughs> well, first, let me thank uh, you all also for this opportunity uh, and to uh, thank my uh, fellow panelists for the chance to be here with them. Uh, let me say first that um, CCRB really um, uh, uh, is heartened by the broad uh, public support, the deep public support for expanding uh, and empowering this agency. Uh, and that, uh, that increases our ability to have the authority to do our job. Um, we appreciate the support by a wide margin uh, for CCRB getting authority over false official statements, 
uh, expanded subpoena authority, uh, greater independence of the board, and then a budget uh, through charter revision is tied to some degree to the police department's budget. Uh, the public also called for and broadly supported CCRB's investigation into sexual misconduct, the prosecution of Daniel Pantaleo, repeal of 50A, and the release of officer disciplinary records, and the investigation into racial profiling by members of the NYPD. Um, we believe as next steps, as council member uh, Adams has uh, pointed out uh, in her remarks uh, that the city should uh, be providing CCRB uh, with uh, unfettered access to body worn camera footage uh, and other evidence as we need it. And that the state should also provide uh, CCRB with final disciplinary authority and then exempt CCRB from ceiling statutes. Now I wanna say I'm really appreciative of the fact that the police commissioner uh, signed an MOU uh, with uh, CCRB around the disciplinary matrix so that we get closer to concurrence when it comes to the discipline recommendations CCRB makes and what the police commissioner actually finally approves. But I believe that in the city of New York for those CCRB cases, CCRB should have final authority and there are opportunities where uh, when the final decision that CCB, CCRB makes is disagreed with, there'll be opportunities for officers uh, to have other means of, of redress around that. And we can talk about those details later. But um, I do believe that uh, uh, final authority is crucial uh, to how this agency operates. Uh, it gives the public greater confidence uh, in civilian oversight. Uh, and it allows for greater transparency uh, in policing here in the city. And I appreciate the support of the council uh, for that. I appreciate the support of City Hall for, um, for advancing the notion of um, exemption from the ceiling statutes in Albany as well. Let me say finally that supporting and empowering the CCRB is common sense, uh, it's a common sense solution to achieving this greater account accountability and improving the relationship between the community and police. People understand and support the notion that police officers shouldn't police themselves. And the CCRB was created in part by the late David Dinkins in its current manifestation by the late Mayor Dinkins because of a lack of accountability and poor uh, police community relations. Empowering the agency to do what it is meant to do is essential and would show the rest of the nation a viable path uh, for increasing uh, police accountability. I'll stop there, but I'm Thank willing you. to address some of these other issues. Thank you. And when you say the ceiling statutes, that's about officer uh, disciplinary records, right? Uh, no, it's about the evidence that the CCRB oh, okay. has access to in the adjudication of oh, the okay. cases that come okay. before. Thank you. And and yeah. Deputy Commissioner Miller, the, the question of a final authority on discipline matters, where does the department stand on that um, reform at this point? Oh, I think the commissioner stands on uh, a common sense platform there, which is in every place where the police chief does not have final say on discipline, uh, you see a situation that is not what people expect from this. You know, in Chicago, whatever the chief decides goes to an arbitration board uh, that is appointed by the aldermen. And what you see is a, a place where the police chief fires police officers for serious misconduct. It goes to a board and then that police officer is restored and is back in the department. And there are cases where they've gone on to commit other serious misconduct. If you talk to Chuck Ramsey, the former head of the major city chiefs association, who was the chief of police in Washington, DC and the police commissioner of Philadelphia and comes out of the Chicago police, he will tell you his experience in Philadelphia, where he had the authority of the police department to impose discipline and that they could go to an outside board and appeal those things. And officer after officer who was either fired or suspended uh, from the force was returned and returned after a period of time with full back pay. The Marine Corps doesn't do it that way. The FBI doesn't do it that way. No city agency, the fire department, the board of ed, you name it, doesn't do it that way. The buck stops here, which is when you're in charge of the agency 
and you get that discipline up there, um, you know I'm responsible for what this person did or what they might do if we let them stay. And once you get into a committee, where does the buck stop? Does it stop yeah. with the board members? Does it stop with the political appointees? Does it, it's, is it like the parole board where you don't know who voted how? So I think this is, a, this is an issue that we need to look at more about places that have tried it and how it's gone there before we change it based on the feeling. So we don't want to stick with just this one topic, but I do want to give um, Council Member Adams and, and Chair Davey a, a brief moment uh, just on this topic uh, to, to respond. Go ahead, uh, Council Member. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Chair Davey. Sure. Go ahead. I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, let me just say that the, with a disciplinary, disciplinary matrix as we have it, um, it um, given that it allows uh, for uh, very little um, uh, wiggle room, if you will, in the, t in, in the discipline applied to specific infractions. Um, it's, gonna, it's clear now to everybody what the results will be when an officer takes an action that violates either the patrol guide or the law. Um, and so it makes final authority for CCRB cases for CCRB cases, excessive force, abuse of authority, discourtesy and offensive language, even more plausible uh, because we have a fairly significant guide and how those cases should be adjudicated and what kind of discipline should be made uh, with regard to them. Uh, I think what we've seen is, um, and no uh, casting no aspersions uh, on any of the commissioners, but a culture where um, there is just a tendency not to, um, not to hold officers accountable and not to honor uh, CCRB's uh, recommendations. Um, this matrix uh, makes, that, um, uh, makes the fact that CCRB uh, uh, having final authority uh, a lot more plausible because we have specific penalties tied to specific infractions. Uh, the commissioners already agreed that only in extraordinary circumstances would there be any uh, deviation. We say, let's remove that and let's have this authority resting only with the CCRB okay. for CCRB cases. For CCRB cases, right. Uh, Council Member Adams, if you wanna take a moment on that, but then why don't you uh, move to the broader question of the, the city council's role in oversight of the police department as you are public safety chair now, how are you thinking about that role? And a year after the protest that uh, Commissioner Miller mentioned and the police department announcing a different approach to policing protests um, just recently, a lot of discussion coming out of a, a department of investigation report an attorney general report. Um, but go ahead and take a take a moment on uh, the ultimate disciplinary authority, if you'd like, and then how you're thinking about oversight of the department from your role and the city council's role at this point. Yeah, thanks, Ben. You know, I, I couldn't agree with uh, Chair Davey Moore um, as far as the again the authority of CCRB, uh, the disciplinary matrix, which I, I think is is a very very good start. Still, my problem tends to be that long that long-term result and that ultimate authority still resting with the police commissioner. It's got a lot to do with public trust and um, public trust has to be restored um, so that we can fully, fully believe in that transparency and accountability. Um, the disciplinary matrix is very new. It's not really been you know, tried yet. So we've got to wait and see over time how that's going to work and what the results will really be real time before quite frankly, before I think the public really believes in it, that, that things will change, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that it won't look, that it won't still look so, uh, you know, uh, subjective, you know, and, and just with a lot of nepotism and, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. Uh, we need to make sure that the public has the faith um, in this system, in the disciplinary matrix, um, you know, and we won't know that until the matrix is actually tried so that we can see that it is actually true. 
Um, and again, for, for, for those watching, this new disciplinary metric sets up sort of categories of, of misconduct and the resultant uh, accountability measures that should come with them with, as our panelists have mentioned, some police uh, department, police commissioner discretion, but it, it lays out a lot more of a framework for, um, for those categories and those, those accountability measures. Um, uh, Councilmember Adams, go ahead on the, on the larger question of where you see the council at in terms of oversight of the department and especially related to some of these practices related to interactions with the public around protest and around you know, public gatherings and such. Yeah, uh, well, uh, again, you know, when we passed uh, the bill, uh, the, the package a few weeks ago, one of the things that I said was that we've got, we still got a long way to go with reform. We've got a lot to answer to. We're still at the floor and not the ceiling yet. We are still taking recommendations and listening to the public. We are listening to our advocates. Uh, we've seen the way that some things have been handled across the country. Um, I believe that we will have uh, federal police reform. I think that that is going to come from the top sooner than later. I think that that is going to help overall the entire country reckon with the reality of police reform. New, New York, it, we're in we're in better shape, you know, as as. Uh, as Mr. Miller said, as the, the uh, deputy commissioner said, I think that we are in better shape. We, every, you know, we're off track, of course, but what we have to keep in mind when it comes to NYPD in New York City uh, is that NYPD is still the model for the country as far as policing is concerned. So uh, where we've got a long way to go as far as accountability and a lot of other things, uh, NYPD is still the model for the country, but we've got to do better. Uh, we, we have to do better. We have to do better legislatively, and I believe that we will. Commissioner Miller, a lot of, when we, when we zoom out from this conversation, a lot of what we're talking about is uh, culture change. It's, it's talking, it's about, um, you know, the culture within the department. Now, that could be legislated, there could be new mechanisms put in, there could be powers removed, um, but we're still talking a lot about culture change here. Um, after six plus years of reform last year, we still saw these significant problems with the way that the protests were policed. Um, we've now seen some many, many additional changes in the year since. How does culture change happen at the police department? And is, is there a reason that so many people feel like it hasn't happened fast enough, significantly enough uh, under this mayor? Well, I think that when you talk about culture change in policing, uh, that's a valid discussion. When you talk about culture change in the NYPD, uh, as Councilman Adams uh, hinted at, part of our culture is change, meaning the NYPD is a place that is constantly changing. And, you know, when you go over the number of reforms, improvements, new initiatives that uh, occur in the course of a year, even, uh, in the NYPD. If you go back to Commissioner Bratton, Commissioner O'Neill, and Commissioner Shea, the three commissioners that have been uh, here over the, the two terms of this mayor, uh, there is a very impressive menu of change. So when we sent that list to Albany, uh, a lot of the 90% of what the rest of the country's law enforcement, and I think this is what Councilman Adams meant when she said the NYPD is the model, 90% of what the rest of law enforcement across the country is, is being asked to do now are initiatives that we are have either done and completed, some of them a couple of years ago, some of them more, or, or in, in the progress of completing from having started before, uh, before the George Floyd incident uh, as a result of looking at other things in other cities. The NYPD is a growing, changing, living, moving organization and change is built in. Now, I guess the one of the key and I mean, just Ben, just to talk about oh. the the, dem the demonstrations, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Department of Investigation report was very critical, uh, but also for those reports, uh, relatively objective in terms of they dug deep into the facts. Um, they came up with recommendations. We adopted 100% of those recommendations and except for the ones that require a lot of administrative rebuilding 
as far as the tactics in the street, uh, they were adopted immediately, uh, built into the training and applied immediately. You saw that the other night. So it's- uh, For example, letting community affairs officers take more of the lead in interacting with uh, protesters, correct? Right. And I mean, I, I think uh, what you see is community affairs is engaged out front um, in every protest now. Uh, I, also, I also know, because I was there, community affairs was engaged in the protest immediately after the George Floyd killing, uh, but people weren't engaging back, um, which caused community affairs to say, this is just not the time to try and have this conversation here. Uh, because right, of the there, hostilities there. Well, there, right, there are challenges here that we're, we won't unpack in this discussion about the police monitoring protests against police uh, brutality that creates a whole um, you know, powder keg there in some ways. Just, just quickly, uh, Commissioner Miller, um, I think when you talk about the reforms and the, and the retrainings and things like that, I think one of the things that folks will say is that that all looks good, it sounds good, it may be having some impact, but the question is, do officers still have, you know, do officers have the sense that misconduct will be swiftly and significantly addressed within the department? And <laughs> where, where do you see that at, at this point in terms of that culture uh, of, of accountability within the department? So, I mean, I, I, I laugh during the question because, you know, if you, if you ask uh, critics and advocates, they say there's no accountability. And if you ask police officers, they believe the accountability is draconian. Uh, we're an extraordinarily accountable agency. Uh, charges are brought, investigations are done. They're extraordinary, extraordinarily uh, thorough. You know, when I, when I uh, talk to Chairman Davies, you know, there's some mythology out there. One of the myths is, and I read this uh, in a major newspaper, that the police commissioner downgraded from CCRB recommendation 70% of the time, that the fact is that the police commissioner goes with the CCRB recommendations about 89% of the time. Actually, the opposite is true. You really have to torture the numbers to get to that other claim. And I think we looked at, uh, since the discipline matrix came out, uh, seven or nine cases, and in four of those, the police commissioner departed upward uh, in terms of discipline uh, from the recommendations. So it's, sure. it's, 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 it's a very accountable organization to the extent that if you look at the amount of money that police officers are fined in these cases, uh, it comes to the hundreds of dollars, the thousands of dollars, no other agency does that. And I, I think it's, it's worth discussing publicly more than we do. And Chair, Chair Davey, um, and this kind of combines a question we've received from the audience as we're here in our last five minutes. Um, we've got some great questions coming in, uh, which, which will bump one or two of, of mine. Um, but Chair Davey, how do you think about what, how the CCRB and, and just yourself assesses the, the culture change and the culture in the department around accountability? And are you, are you comfortable at this point with um, sort of how the department is interacting with your agency in terms of uh, things like body camera footage and the other things that you need? Because um, that's part of the culture here as well around accountability, of course, that you're directly involved with. Sure. Well, let me say a few things. I think uh, we could uh, go back and forth over the numbers when it comes to concurrence and uh, commissioner concurring with CCRB. Um, I think last year uh, in the most serious cases, uh, uh, the ch charges and specification cases, um, the concurrence rate was, was woefully low, uh, but, but we're getting there. Um, and so I wanna give credit where credit is due in terms of, again, the MOU and the matrix and a commitment from the commissioner not to deviate unless in extraordinary circumstances. But um, I would uh, not totally agree with Deputy Commissioner Miller's numbers, but um, we'll get our staffs together and we'll, we'll work through that. Um, in terms of um, things like body-worn camera footage and other uh, information that we need, we have, a, we have a process set up that got preempted by COVID uh, with the department to give the CCRB greater access than we had uh, to body worn camera footage, and we'll, and we'll get to implementing, we'll implement that 
uh, once we are sufficiently on the other side of, uh, of, of, of the coronavirus and COVID. That said, there is enough technology out there. There are cities around the country where investigators have direct access to body-worn camera footage. And for all the reasons that have been given uh, for why CCRB investigators should not have access, direct access to body-worn camera footage, uh, there are technical solutions to that uh, that can easily be put into place. So we need to continue to have that conversation. We've made progress. We've got more progress we need to make. There's other evidence that the CCRB often needs that we don't get from the department as quickly as we should. Some evidence they claim is sealed, which is why we have asked and the mayor supported uh, and the council supported, uh, as well as the attorney general, the CCRB get, have an exemption from the uh, sealing statute. Finally, uh, I will say um, uh, there is um, a, a fairly productive working relationship between the CCRB staff and the staff at the NYPD. It can always be better. It can always be improved, uh, but we're, you know, we're we're getting we're getting there. I think if we address these other issues, final authority, sealing statutes, direct access to body-worn camera footage, civilian oversight will be even stronger, and the people of the city of New York will have confidence that there's true accountability and transparency in how we hold police accountable in this city. Now, Councilmember Adams, uh, you've including at today's event and obviously many others, you've spoken very forcefully about police reform, about the need for um, more accountable policing, uh, racially just policing, but you also were not out there calling for a you know significant defunding of the NYPD in last year's uh, budget and we're coming up to budget season again. Speak, uh, just take a minute here, we are in our last couple of minutes, but about how you think about that discussion around resources for the department, safe policing, a safe city and, and respectful uh, policing? Great question. You know, um, I, I'm not fond of the language of defunding. Uh, a lot of us uh, think of defunding as taking it all, taking everything off the table. Um, and, you know, I'm more of a reallocation, reassignment uh, conversation. I think that um, some of the funding for, for the police department needs to be reallocated, quite frankly, as a lot do, and put into other areas um, that police, quite frankly, don't belong in, mental health being at the top of the list. So when we speak about where resources should, should go um, and where things should be moved around, that's, that's one place that I'm thinking as far as mental health services. Something else that hasn't come up uh, often enough, I believe that, um, civilianization and where those, uh, where those jobs are right now. I happen not to believe that a police officer in uniform needs to be sitting behind a desk, where, uh, where civilians need to be seated, where those jobs need to be provided to those individuals. I think that those opportunities are taken away on a grand scale now, and that's something else that we've got to look at in the council very seriously. Um, you know, it, it's such, it's such a a large, large conversation um, that is to be had. And, you know, I, I'm excited about the conversation. I'm excited about the changes, I'm excited about the reform um, that we still have, uh, uh, you know, on the table. Um, it, it, it's, it's a lot to consider, but we have made progress, Ben. We've made good progress in the council. I mean, we passed the POST Act you know, to make NYPD's use of surveillance technology and, and uh, safeguards to protect civil liberties transparent. We passed two major reform packages in less than a year. So that just gives us an idea, you know, of not only the appetite for reform in New York, but also the council's commitment to police reform and accountability, which has been spurred by the reckoning we've had over the past year. And a uh, smart, attentive watcher of the program has also noted uh, among the many, many reforms that there will be a start to uh, local precinct councils having input around precinct commanders uh, as, as one of those changes uh, that, was, that was sought for and agreed to. Commissioner Miller, uh, in, in one last minute here, on this discussion of resources and reallocation of both funding, but all, but really more it's about the responsibilities that Councilmember Adams got at because the funding often goes with the responsibilities. 
does the department agree that there are certain responsibilities that could be moved towards other city agencies uh, or other city agencies could take the lead on for, for example? Uh, most definitely. Uh, but the reality is that, you know, in society, there are structures, there are, does everybody get the equal uh, education? Uh, the answer traditionally across this country has been no. Does everybody have equal access to health care? The answer has been no. Does everybody have equal access uh, to good housing? The answer has been no. Society has these safety nets built in, social services and other things, but the nets have holes in. They always have. And when people fall through those holes, at the bottom, the person who's standing there with the, with the big catcher's mitt is usually a police officer. We didn't look to get into the mental health business or the homeless business or dealing with all the other problems of society, but when those things culminate with the failure of the federal government, the state government and others to support and provide those services, and it comes to a crisis situation, they call the police because the police are the ones who always show up. And we got pretty good at dealing with the homeless. Uh, we learned a lot about dealing with mental health issues. We've tried to fill in those gaps. And while I don't disagree, we shouldn't be in those businesses. Uh, before you remove uh, those services by road, they should be replaced by the services that should have been there all along. And I think we're at a crossroads where we have pulled back on one end without filling in on the other end. Uh, and that's gonna take time. All right, and that, that conversation and, and many other elements of this is definitely happening right now and we will be heating up, uh, as I mentioned, as the city budget conversation gets going again now in the, in the next couple of months. We could keep going for hours here, but we have to stop. Um, CCRB Chair Fred Davey, thank you so much. City Council Member Adrian Adams, thank you. Deputy Commissioner John Miller, thank you. Don't go anywhere, anybody, for just one second. Uh, this has been uh, such a, a great and thoughtful conversation. And thank you to our, our great panelists. And thank you to Citizens Union and Citizens Union Foundation for bringing us all uh, together and for all of you for watching. Uh, I do want to note that um, today, Citizens Union Foundation is launching a new guide two months out from the primaries in June. Citizens Union Foundation is launching a new guide at electnyc.org electnyc.org and the website link will be put in the chat uh, two months out from the primary day and that is a new comprehensive guide to the New York City elections that are happening now the many 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 candidates running hundreds of candidates running in many races from mayor through the city council and it's a new comprehensive guide to help you know who's voting what they're all about help you break down some of the key issues and candidates and take an in-depth, nonpartisan, unbiased look at what's happening in the city elections with a lot of information. So please do visit electnyc.org and follow electnyc2021 on social media. That's at electnyc2021. And everybody attending here, if you've missed them, there have been two others of these recent civic conversations that have been uh, really thoughtful panels. You can find those at the Citizens Union website. There will be others coming up that you'll hear about. And the big annual Citizens Union Spring for Reform event will be the week of June 7th. So please look out for more information from Citizens Union and Citizens Union Foundation about Spring for Reform. So as you check out all these police reforms, as you visit us at Gotham Gazette, as you go to electnyc.org, and do all of these other things I'm asking you to do here. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for being here. And thank you to our great panelists. Thank you. Thanks thank for you. having us. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank yeah. you Enjoyed being here. Thank you.